Today's topic is nuclear weapons. And the reason I'm telling you about them is I want to make sure this is distinguished from nuclear power. And the real key here is the following. Uranium comes out of the ground with very little of uranium-235. That's the fissile stuff, the stuff that can fission easily with any energy neutron. To make a nuclear reactor work, you need to enrich that fuel to 3%. But that will not make an atom bomb. To make a bomb, you need the uranium-235 to be at 90%. And that's why facilities like this one of centrifuges is very important. Enrichment facilities are large, they take a lot of energy and a lot of time to get the uranium up to that type of purity level, you could say, of the U-235. The reason this is needed is because you need to have enough of the fission reactions go off fast enough before the entire thing disintegrates. After all, it's a bomb. Let's look at what's inside them. We somehow have to get to this amount of uranium-235 or other fissile material like plutonium-239 all in one spot. Critical mass. If you have too little of it, the neutrons will leak out before they are able to initiate another fission reaction. So there's a key amount of the material that's needed, a critical amount, a critical mass. If you just started with that critical mass, you would automatically have a bomb. It would spontaneously at some point emit a neutron which would then trigger the entire chain reaction and that wouldn't be very useful. So you need to decide to assemble the two pieces that are subcritical into a critical mass. One way you could see illustrated here is you've got two halves and you have a regular chemical explosion like you know TNT, it pushes them together. In another system you start with something spongy in other words, not at the full density of the metal, and you take explosions from around the side and condense it together. It's called an implosion method. So the very first bomb used the scun type method. And it wasn't really two halves. You can see you have this hollow cylinder, subcritical, and then you have this cylindrical target here, also subcritical. And you basically, like a gun, shoot this so that it will come and go over the top of it. And you might say, isn't it going to keep going? Sure. But we only need microseconds for this chain reaction to start up and go all the way to completion, meaning you have the uncontrolled release of the nuclear energy. There are some things you can do to allow yourself to use less of the critical part, less, a smaller critical mass. And that's this other stuff that's sitting around here. Okay? This is often called a tamper or a neutron reflector. Since the key is keeping those neutrons around long enough to cause chain reactions, if you have things that will either produce more neutrons or bounce the neutrons back in, then you need less of the fuel in the first place. There are other parts of bombs you don't want to just rely on that first neutron having to start up, so often there is some type of trigger as well that will start the first neutrons coming out, which will then initiate the chain reaction. This is a video of the first atomic bomb test, the Trinity test in New Mexico. It was during World War II. There was worries that other countries were making nuclear weapons, not just the United States, and to be able to end World War II we needed to get them before other countries did. One of the things you noticed in that video was the mushroom cloud. And it's basically hot gases rushing upward because we've made such an enormous amount of heat right here where the bomb exploded. This superheated air, hot air rises, goes up, and at some point in the atmosphere, the temperature of the air becomes less because it's cooled, and it will now billow out sideways into a cloud, the typical mushroom cloud shape
that people associate with nuclear weapons. One of the keys to understand is that this doesn't have to be a nuclear weapon. It just has to be a really, really big explosion. And if you have that, you will get this type of phenomena. The hot superheated gases rise up into the atmosphere until they reach a point where they cool, they stop rising, and since this sucks up so much dust and dirt and debris, this cloud doesn't look like your normal white cloud, right? This cloud will have more gray in it and darkness because, of course, all this dirt came up. I should also mention about fallout. You see, the fission products from a nuclear explosion are not contained, and that means you have a lot of different radioactive substances. In addition, the neutrons that were produced, the sudden burst of neutrons that made the chain reaction, will also make some of the surrounding dirt and area and things that it hit also into radioactive substances. These then come up into this plume, and this plume will spread out. And that's the fallout. The original nuclear weapons were relatively small, maybe 25 kilotons. What that measure means is that's 25,000 tons of TNT, of dynamite, of normal high energy explosive. 25 kilotons is a small bomb by today's standards. Today, these bombs are often in the megaton range, equivalent to a million tons of TNT going off all at once. Even the power of a mere 25 kiloton bomb is devastating. Last year, I went to the Hiroshima uh, Memorial site, saw the original pictures of the devastation, and it is truly horrifying the destruction this type of weapon can do. Of course, it's pretty horrifying the destruction any types of weapons in war can do. The immediate area around where the bomb goes off receive such high heat that everything is incinerated. Then there's an area around here because of this wind, because of this mushroom cloud going up, there is an enormous blast wave, an enormous shock wave, winds like a tornado, 300 miles an hour, trying to knock everything down. And from this, the gamma rays that come out, right, the, the initial radiation at Hiroshima was a slightly larger area where people would get radiation burns from this, even if they were not incinerated or blown away. Today's bombs, the much, much larger ones, have a little different confluence of zones. Their radiation zone, of course, may be a bit bigger, but the uh, blast zone and the air zone where you hit the 300 mile an hour winds are even larger. So while it's kind of silly to say this, if you actually survive seeing a nuclear bomb go off, you don't have to worry about the radiation. You have to worry about the fallout. But this area where the invisible gamma rays may have penetrated your body is far inside the place where you would have been incinerated, turned to dust, and blown away. So the bare gun type bomb using uranium-235 was the simplest design and the one they probably had the most confidence would really work. But it took a lot of the fissile material. And that's the real difficult thing in making a nuclear weapon. The designs, everything I'm showing you, it's on the web, right? It's in Wikipedia or some other easily searchable website. The key is getting the fissile material. Let's look at this comparison. If you're using uranium-235 and you just want to not use something that reflects the neutrons, which takes a lot more engineering, you can see you need a lot more of the fuel, of the weapons-grade material. If, on the other hand, you use a tamper, something that would reflect the neutrons, your critical mass need drops dramatically. And then there's plutonium-239. Plutonium does not naturally occur. 
has a half-life on the order of 24,000 years. So even if some was made in the Big Bang, it's long since gone. You can make plutonium, though, in a nuclear reactor. Now, the thing is that if you try to make this in your run-of-the-mill power-generating nuclear reactor, you get the wrong mix of isotopes. The plutonium that comes out of your fission power plant down the street making electricity is not plutonium-239. It, once again, is a mix of isotopes. You'd have to go to your centrifuges or other enrichment facility and pull out the plutonium-239. Of course, if you could do that, you could not even need to make plutonium in the first place. You could just start with uranium. You can simply find or mine or buy. But if you design a reactor just right, like a military reactor, it can actually turn uranium into plutonium and you can take that plutonium out and extract it, and it does have the right isotope mix. It is the plutonium-239. And you can see that plutonium-239 is much more efficient. You can use less of it to be able to make the same size bomb. And once again, if you then add some type of neutron reflecting material, you're able to do it even with a smaller amount of the critical mass substance. The next bombs that were made were using the implosion type. And this takes a lot more engineering because even though you have this plutonium core and a neutron initiator to, to give you the bang right where you want it, you have the tamper material and then you have this high explosive around here that you need to push together and have it work just right and have it condense this material without blowing it through one side or another. Much trickier engineering. Here's an animation that sort of shows what needs to go on. The high explosives go out, they crush the tamper, push the tamper down to the plutonium, the trigger goes off, and now you get the initiated critical mass nuclear explosion. The U.S. was the first ones to create, test, and illustrate fission nuclear weapons. It wasn't too long after that that the Soviet Union did it. And then after the Soviet Union, the American European allies of the United Kingdom, and France, and then China. For a long time, it were those five countries that had nuclear weapon capabilities. In fact, those are the five permanent members of the UN Security Council for exactly that reason. In time, of course, the genie is out of the bottle, the science is known, and if a country is dedicated to doing their enrichment, they can make nuclear weapons as well. In the 70s, we saw India join this club and then Pakistan. Now, it's rumored that both Israel and South Africa also had the capability. Not proven, but probably likely. In fact, I would say any advanced, technologically advanced country could make a nuclear weapon if they wanted to. And that's the real key, because many have signed treaties that say, you know, there's enough nuclear weapons around. We don't need to uh, make them ourselves. We can rely on our allies, or now that the Cold War is over, maybe we don't even need them at all. The most recent member of the nuclear club is North Korea. North Korea has demonstrated several nuclear devices uh, over the last few years. If you think a fission bomb is big, then what about an H-bomb? An H-bomb is a hydrogen bomb because it actually uses nuclear fusion. That's the energy source the sun has. But it isn't easy to do at all. You see, we first need to start with your same atom bomb I just showed you. This is an implosion type nuclear weapon. And we need that to get the temperatures high enough to actually get the deuterium and tritium to combine and fuse. The only way to get this high enough temperature and high enough density is put it inside an atom bomb and blow up the atom bomb. A tritium has a short half-life of 12 years. 
So the clever way it's done is you actually create the tritium in place. And that's why there's this lithium-6 deuterite. Deuterium and tritium is what will fuse, but if you put enough neutrons into lithium, it turns into tritium. So how do we get those neutrons? Well, we need to multiply our neutrons. So you can see that you have uh, uranium here as a tamper, which will create more neutrons. And you even have a plutonium spark plug that once their chain reaction takes place and we've created this tritium, we're going to have an even bigger regular fission explosion, which can then trigger the fusion explosion. H-bombs were invented through the 50s, and in 1956, the U.S. tested one. Here's the sequence that it goes through. We have it sitting here. We have the nuclear bomb go off. You have reflecting materials, making neutrons come in. These neutrons multiply. It creates the deuterium-tritium fuel. And finally, that deuterium-tritium ignites. And you not just have maybe your one megaton bomb or half a megaton bomb, but now you have something in the tens of megatons. This video is at Bikini Atoll in May 1956, and this is where the U.S. tested the first H-bomb. We've got two different views of it, and you can see that the blast is incredibly large. They expected this bomb to maybe be three megatons, but it turned out to be 15. The age of get bigger and bigger bombs was born. It wasn't too many years after this that the Soviet Union also created their H-bomb. In fact, they made the biggest bomb that's ever been seen in the world, called the Tsar Bomba. Over 50 megatons of explosion. It's really wonderful that nuclear bombs have only ever been used in one short time period in the world. My sincere hope, and I'm sure everyone's in the world, is that they won't be used as weapons. What I wanted to illustrate today is that nuclear weapons are very different things than nuclear power. A controlled fission chain reaction can be extremely beneficial to mankind. A uncontrolled fission reaction or fusion reaction, a bomb, is of course not all that great for mankind. That's what you need to know about nuclear weapons.